Hi guys, welcome back to Hear Our Voices. This is the last installment of Elizabeth's story. I hope you enjoyed the first two part of the podcast. Sit back, relax, grab a bag of chips, grab something to drink, and listen to the story. Or you could be cleaning around the house. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and some other things are coming up too. So stay tuned, and the information will be down below. Bye. You know, because they, they've been through so much till when DHS, like, hey, we got a place for you. You got to send us paperwork. My 17-year-old was like, yeah, sure, we're getting an apartment. And then a year later, something's going to happen and we're going to have to move. And I'm like, oh, my God. But this is what this you know, situation with vouchers and all of that did to him traumatically because he doesn't have no belief, you know, in it. For him, there is never permanent housing. Right. Because in his mind, we're always moving anyway, you know? So it's like, okay, let me know when we got to pack up again. And I'm like, no, no. You know, trying to explain to him, like, it's going to be, you know, I'm just trying to show him the positive side. And, you know, going to be, what, two years now, we're still here. And I'm like, so what do you think? We're still here. And he's like, mm, maybe. <laughs> he don't know. <laughs> he's like, it's been a lot. You can't blame him because... He's not the only one that's going through this journey that's feeling that same way. Right. Because it's like, no matter what you do, if they stop paying rent, what do we do? You know, if the landlord say, hey, I want you out, although you're paying the rent, you can say, okay, I'm going to fight them. But it's like, nothing is concrete. Nothing is, is, is sealed in stone just because you you you're a low income family you know and i even think people with money that could be taken away also in a minute so it's so true. not nothing is nothing is set in stone so true so it's like you want to say yeah i feel you we're going to stay positive that we're going to be here for a while. Um, but with all he's been through, I, I get it. You know, because I, I, I try to understand it from their point of view. You know, I, I was the one making, you know, making all the deals, getting us to places while he's in the background, just looking and just listening. Oh, we got to go again. Up, oh, she's at court again. You know, so like I explained to him, I understand, I get it. And I'm like, I'm gonna try my best for us to be here for a while. You know. So he he understands, but you know, it's it's hard being a kid to go through the process. It is it is not easy. It at definitely all. is that. You know. I want to talk about, um, I don't think we touched on it as much, the mm -hmm. living conditions that you had in shelter. Mm -hmm. how, was it for, how was it for you, like, living there? Did you have a stove? Because a lot of times, some, some shelters don't have stoves, some of them do. But I know you've been in and out of a lot of different shelters. Yeah. For a couple of them. So you might have different experiences at each one, like I had. So how was the experience? And how more about the staff and things like that? And what things do you think they could be doing better in the shelter to help out people? In in 2005, honestly, that's why I saw a lot, a lot of different shelters. Honestly, everybody do their own thing. I guess they're adhering to DHS rules or whatever. But at some point, you know, it's their management. They They do how they see fit. Right. They all had different curfews. So I, I just thought, you know, all of them would have the same time. Mm -mm. Everybody had different curfews. Um, 
The one that stood out to me the most um, was the one we went to in June, 2005. Um, about that time, maybe we saw, um, I would say four different shelters before getting, getting to the, the one we stayed at um, for a couple months in 2005. Um, we even went, the first time we went, um, they put us in a scatter site. That was traumatic for everyone because I think the people used to sell, whether it was cigarette or weed or drugs, but people came knocking on the door and scatter site has no security. Well, when we were there, wow, there was no that security. Sounds crazy. <laughs> There's no security. There's no staff. When you have an appointment or something, you, you'll get an envelope under the door. Um, but, you know, in regular shelters, you want the community. You want to say, I can go to the office tomorrow. You want to say there's security there. So I feel a little bit safe. But at scatter sites, there was nothing. Some people love it because they're like, nobody can tell you anything. You can do what you want. Yes. But sometimes you need that structure of knowing that I feel safe and somebody's going to be there. Because getting people to knock on your door all hours of the night and during the day is very, for me, very scary. Um, because you don't know who's there. Do you want to answer it? No. No. <laughs> you know, but you still have to because they're going to stay there until you do. So, you know, especially at the time, I, I, we were still with my ex-husband. So if he's at work and I'm just there with the kids and people are coming by, like, you feel unprotected because there is no security. Right. You know, so so scatter sites are very, for me, very scary. Um, most of the places, there was a stove. Okay. For me, that was a plus because I'm the type of person, just because I come from the Caribbean, I need to cook my food every day. I need to feed my kids every day. Um. While doing fast tracking, there was a lot of places that was, there was no stove. Um, but if you're getting in there after eight at night, nobody has time to cook um, because you're just spending the night. Right. But most of the times I'm usually getting sandwiches or going to the Spanish restaurants, getting food. Um, so it didn't matter if I had a stove or not. Um, some places was maybe a mini fridge and a microwave. I think we went once that you had to share bathrooms and that was like, I have kids. How do, how do I share a bathroom or a shower stall and knowing somebody else is right beside me and I have to, you know, have my kids get showered and stuff. So it was very, very, they need to improve a lot of their, um, their stuff. Um, I had also worked with um, Coalition for the Homeless when it came to fast tracking because it, it was too much. You know, as soon as you, you um, you didn't get accepted. You have to do this whole process over again. Um, was very very frustrating. Then, while I was at um, the one in Brooklyn that we spent four years at, there was I'm not sure if you're familiar. There was a school in Chinatown. Apparently it was also a shelter, but this is where the big executive had their meetings. 
So basically, I felt like I got interrogated by DHS because I was there too long. And they're like, they want to know what you're going to do. And I literally just sat there, said nothing, pretended I was dumb just to hear what they have to say. But for me, I had the Coalition for the Homeless, you know, behind me just in case they wanted to do anything that they're not supposed to do. Um, because I've heard that people got kicked out of the shelter, like you're already homeless. How do you kick a family out on the streets? They like, do it all the time, and they do it all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, are you kidding me? And, and I think that's where they wanted to go with us. But I just sat there, I said nothing. I'm like, okay, you know, whatever they were like, are you gonna comply? My answer was yes or sure. You know, I try not to like open my mouth and voice my opinion because I felt like if I did that, I was gonna hurt my kids because I knew what they were doing was wrong. Um, but as soon as the meeting over, I think I had to go there twice just because I was a long term stare. Um, I went to the coalition and I'm like, this is what happened. This is what they said. This is the papers they gave me. And they were like, they were like waiting. They're like, listen, if you have to call us during the weekend, this is my cell number. You call us. We'll be there. We will help you. So if you have that security behind you, you know, it's like, how are you fighting the people that they're supposed to be helping you? Right. And they're not helping you. You know, government didn't give no vouchers at the time. I guess Bloomberg was on his own stuff at the time, not giving anything. Mm. Um, but most of the shel most of the shelters that we went to <sighs> horrible. There was always um, mice feces in the apartments. Mm. Yeah, roaches like insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, nothing was there. So how are roaches there? <laughs> Like there's nothing to take on the table. The fridge is, this is like you're just walking in. Right. And there's nothing there, but plain sofas, a big, huge table, an empty fridge. You know, everything looks clean. Yeah. Why is there mice? Why is there roaches? Lips can be deceiving. <laughs> That's the thing. Lips can be deceiving. And I'm telling you, we spent four and a half years in the one in Brooklyn. And when they put us back there, I think this was maybe four or five years later, nothing had changed. That's why they was there, the rats and roaches. It's like, we know what's up. We know what's going to happen. <laughs> this is crazy. Nothing. The bathroom was patches. Yeah. Like you can really literally see the duct tape on the tank for the bathroom and then they painted over it. Oh no. They painted the tub. What shocked me was one of the, the, the flooring for the tile crack. And these people, you know, from DHS coming all the way from Albany, you know, the big wigs, they're coming to inspect the apartments. So they come in and they are putting the same tile. And I'm like, you guys still have the tile? Like, how do you still have the same tile? And painting everything to make everything look so brand new and nice. It wasn't. Right. You know, and then this is to make matters worse. So I have an aunt that lives in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And her husband has been here from, I think, late 60s. So when he dropped us off, I think it was, it was 2019. 
And he's like, oh, you're at the same place, but a different building. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I used to live in this building. Oh, wow. He described the building inside while living there in 1970s. Are you serious? And I explained to him, I said, let me tell you something. You just described my whole apartment. Nothing has changed down to the color of the walls and the flooring. Nothing. So he was living there because his aunt was, you know, that was her apartment. Right. Before the shelter or whoever agency took it over. Over, yeah. It was regular apartments. And I was like, nothing has changed. They, they have done nothing to these buildings, but paint over it because you can see the chippings of that layer of coat, coat uh, you know, paint, coat of paint. Right. So I was like, I mean, I knew the building was old, but till he gave me that part of history and I was like, it really explained a lot. You know, and I was like, honestly, nothing, nothing has changed. Same old bedrooms, same old, old bathroom. Because they, they didn't even say like, okay, let's fix the place up. Let's get new bathrooms, you know, new toilets, new tub. Let, let's the place, let the place look livable. Right. You know, you're just being here for temporary. But. You know, you don't have to live here like, you know, here. Just that's that's for you, something, you know. Yeah. You're not gonna be here long anyway. So why would you think why would you care how it looks? And I'm like, that's not even the point. It really isn't. Maybe feel like a human. We feel like, you know. Nah, nah, nope. You're not supposed to feel like a human. That's crazy. Mm, you're not. Same old dressers. I think the only thing they changed when a client leaves were the mattresses. At least. And I'm surprised. <laughs> That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So every time a client leaves, they, they, they get new mattresses. Everything else stays the same. Nothing I'm surprised. Does the shelter, I, I don't know if my shelter did this or not, but I think they probably did it because most of them had like mattress covers. So I feel like they didn't even change those when people left, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What changed though, um, the last time we went back in 2019, so, you know, well, I guess, I guess they do this for families. When you go, they give you a kit, blankets, yeah. um, pots, so this last time I was shocked. The blankets were better, but one pot. And I'm like, what am I you got a pot. <laughs> <laughs> like one pot. And it's the it's like it's the pots you would find in like a dollar store. Oh no. It's very, very thin. Like, just give me aluminum pans then, because basically that's what you're, you know, giving me. Right. Um, and in 2019, my oldest daughter, um, she had come back to New York. Okay. And because she was staying with me, she also had to go with her family to the shelter. But her experience was way different from mine. When she showed me, I was like, wow. They gave them a portable AC. So I'm like, not here, girl. Mm -mm. <laughs> not in this place. They don't even give you a fan. They had a portable AC, a sleeper sofa. Um, when she got her kit, it was a whole pot set. Yeah, different stuff do different things. That's why. With utensils. And I was like, Wow. Yeah. What I don't understand is you get money from DHS for all this stuff. They do. They do. Why? Why? Why do we have to go through all this headache? You know, treat people like human beings. You know, because 
years ago, when I did went, I did get a whole pot set, but it was a different shelter. And I knew going back to the same one they had put us to, I honestly didn't expect anything to change because I knew how, how they were before. And <laughs> while I was there, this last time in 2019, um, I went through, I think we were there for maybe a year and a half, but I went through five caseworkers. Of course. That was the most I ever went through um, in any shelter. They go very fast from what I've seen and what I've had myself because they, I guess they don't pay enough. People get burned yeah. out from the job. Yeah, they, they go to a lot of people who are working there, which is kind of crazy. I was there for a year and, uh, and change. Mm -hmm. And I went through, I want to say three or four. And then I had a um, housing specialist. And the first one I got, she wasn't doing her job. I was like, no, can I switch? Because I'm like, this is ridiculous. I said, you can't. I'm like, no, but she's not doing her job. She's mm -hmm. giving certain people certain things. And she's not giving me what I need. And I was watching her. I see how she gives with other clients. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And, I'm, and at the time I was working part-time. And um, I could switch to somebody else, but I ended up getting, at one point, I had my regular caseworker. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting the, the director because nobody else was there for those people, for that person who had left. I got somebody yeah. else. It was just a, it was a revolving door of people. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't mm -hmm. understand. But when I, when I realized they don't pay enough money, people mm -hmm. don't want to stay. And there's a lot of yeah. work. So it's just like, you get upset because they're not doing their job. But mm -hmm. also it's like, they have so much of their job to do. It's like, it's too much for one person to do. And they're not getting paid the, the, the sufficient amount to even survive. Because a lot of them are on, on their self are bring to go yeah. home is just like you because they're not making enough money. Mm -hmm. So it's like, the blind is leading the blind, honestly. But when you're in yeah. a situation you don't think about, like when I was in there, I did not think about, oh, they might be not working that much money. In my mind, I was like, all they do is come to work to get a paycheck. Not thinking that yeah, they yeah. not that much money. <laughs> like, exactly. Because you're so when you're in when you're in there, you you're so wrapped up into yourself because they're going mm -hmm. through the whole thing. But it's like they are also this. I think my glass caseworker and my last home specialist, home, housing specialist, mm -hmm. they both both those homes at one point too. So they know how it was. They told me like, yeah. we know how it feels. We know I understand. That. Like I love them. They were so amazing. I mean, I think, and that's what you need in there. Because if they don't understand how you're doing this or how you're going through it, they don't care and they show it, you know? So if you're already giving me that attitude, guess what's going to happen when I see you again? I'm going to give you attitude too. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to do anything because mm -hmm. you don't care. You're just here for our money. You know, you, you don't care how my week went. What I had to go through with my kids before I even start looking for a place. You know, you don't know how much tantrums my 17 year old was giving that week. Or how many times I had to, you know, cuddle my baby because she was so terrified of something. You know, they don't understand what you're going through. But if they went through it, they'll get it. Right. You know, and, and, and that's, that's the biggest problem because I've heard, um, because like I said, when it comes to education, don't stop me. And my, my college student, um, at the time was in this, um, it was his first time in the high school he was going to he found out that there was a trip to Alaska, but you had to get, um, how'd you get it? You had to get nominated for it. Yeah. Being the person he is, he pestered the principal the whole year. And he, he got on that trip. Yeah. But we had to go to the... I have a question. What do you do for your community? So... Because of all my going to neighbors together 
and I stumbled on to um, Blue Ridge Labs. And they were doing um, like some type of stuff about um, shelters and brokers. And I was like, okay, you know, I don't mind doing your stuff. And I heard about Landlord Watch from there. And then I had to go back into the shelter and I stumbled on Neighbors Together. And I met um, another, uh, one of the same persons from Landlord Watch. They were introducing their bot. And they're like, you know, we did some more meetings and they're like, they had a question to ask me. And, you know, they wanted to know if I could do some more stuff with them. They're creating a website. And they're trying to find a name. So I went through the whole process mm -hmm. of help, you know, giving my feedback with naming, um, website, colors. And now it's called Unlock NYC. And they had asked me to become um, a member of the Leadership Collective. Okay. And I was ready to, ready to go. Um, because... <laughs> I, I wanted people to know this is what's happening. This is my story. You know, a lot of people can relate um, to whatever I'm going through or still going through. And I was ready to find that person that's just like me, that is struggling, um, that single mom, whether she can speak English or not. And I think it's even worse when you can't speak that language. It's 10 times harder if you don't have someone to help you interpret or try to find your voice to even say, well, you know, this is what I need help with. So um, I was ready and it's funny that um, I try to bring partnerships now um, because of the kids, um, I'm on the parent, parent, um, like the PTA association at the charter school, at my son's high school. Um, I'm waiting to hear back to see if I'm on the, um, to get on the board for, um, my daughter's dance school. Um, I'm on the board at, um, for the parent group at Big Brother, Big Sister. Um, so just because I could, you know, bring in a lot of people, that's what I'm trying to do for Unlock. Um, trying to bring in more partners, trying to let people know, like, we are here. We are ready to help you um, report discrimination. It doesn't have to be financial. Most of the time it is. Um, just because they're here, I have a voucher. Guess what? We don't want you or we don't take that. Um, but I just want, you know, more people to be aware, like you don't have to just sit here. Um, you can report these people. And if you, if you want extra help, when you report, you know, and if you're serious and they can help you get that apartment, um, we can try to do that too. Because that's what a lot of people don't know. Um, when I first knew about it, I was like, I, I felt so excited. I was like, that's my light. That's my way to get out. You know, um, because most people, you know, they're going through this journey, but they're so frustrated because it's like, you speak with 10 people for the day and all you hear is the door slamming on you. Like it's a no, 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 no. And going to your caseworker, it's like they're not there for you. You know, when I used to have to go to the meetings with the director, the supervisor, my caseworker, my housing specialist, other people, and you have all these eyes on you. So what are you doing? Well, you're not doing enough. Well, you know, I know you, you, you go this, this day, uh, but you can't volunteer at the school anymore. 
you can't do that. Like they're literally saying you can't do this. Right. So, you know, and I'm like, what about the people that are working that have that full-time job? You know, how are they um, trying to find a place? And you still have to go home and deal with your kids, you know, homework, feeding them, you know, making sure their hygiene is good. Um, you know, it's a lot. You know, and just, just being with my unlock team, it's like, we're, we're trying our best at whatever or whoever we can help. Um, so anybody I speak to, I try to let them know about unlock, especially, you know, if they're going through the process, and even if they're not, mm -hmm. I'm like, listen, you can still go on the website. Um, you know, we have resources. Um, I feel like when you, because of all the experience I went through, even if you have that lease and even if you have that apartment, still come on our website because sometimes you run into problems and you're like, uh, so... Who am I calling? Because I did 311, that didn't help. Where else can I go? Right. Hey, check us out. You never know. We could, if we can't help you, we're gonna find that way to help you. You know, and, and this is this is what I love about you know us is that if we don't know the answer, we're we'll gonna try to answer. find that answer. You know, because we've we've most of, most of our team, you know, have lived experience. So we know um, what people are going through. Right. And I think that's all some people want right now is to know like, hey. You're not alone. You're, you're, you're not alone. So much people are doing the same thing that you're going through. Right. You know, and, and I feel like all people, some people need right now is just to know that there's a person I can call when I'm frustrated. Um, we, we have that person. Like if you make a report today, mm -hmm. we have that person that will give you that call. If it's not this week, it's going to be next week. But she's going to call you and be like, hey, saw your report. You know, she's that person that you, you maybe look up to like, like a mommy figure. Got it. They will. Guess what? We are unlocked. We heard you. We saw your report. You know, she going to give you that pep talk. And if you need resources and she knows it, she going to give it to you. And th this is why, you know, I, I love our team because, you know, we come together and we're, the main goal is to help people. You know. So I, I'm glad that, you know, I, I, I've been through the journey. And I think I'm still on the journey um, because although you have a lease, you, you never know, you know, what can happen. So you just have to, you know, because I know there's people have their apartment, but still going through headaches because I'm paying my rent and my landlord, you know, I just, there's just one time leak. I just need it to be fixed and they don't want to fix it. You know, so I feel like it never stops, you know, or they're having problems with HRA and how do I get help? And what a lot of people don't know is if you have a congressman, an assemblyman, some type of government person in your neighborhood, go to see them. You, would, you, you don't understand what they can do. If your case closes and HR is giving you a headache, go to them. I mean, that, that's what they're there for, you know, to help the people. And a lot of people don't know that. And they don't get, you don't want to say use, but that's what they're there for. They don't get used, you know, as much. You know, if they're serving 20,000 people, I bet you there are only maybe 1,000 people are going there. Just because, you know, People don't know.
I understand. I understand. So we're actually going to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any last words that you want to say to anybody out there who's listening about the shelter system and what you're doing to help out the shelter or homeless community? Um, you know, if you have to go to the shelter, you have to go because you just want that warm bed to say, well, I'm, I'm keeping my, my, my family safe. Um, yes, I know it's frustrating for single people. I've heard some stories, um, but there is so much resources um, out there that I feel like a lot of people don't know that while living in the shelter, um, they can help you, especially if the shelter is acting up. Like just don't sit there because they're not doing anything. Um, they do have some shelters that they are helping people and some that does not care. And I feel like it's all about staff. Um, and, and the thing is, I wish that the shelters would open up to like, you know, at least once a week or once a month. Um, even if they have, say, if they have five new people coming in or five new families coming in or whatever your, your shelter is there for, um, you know, even if it's DV cases, give some of the, the, the resource people, you know, neighbors together, um, unlock. Like, get, give us that time to come in. You know, let, let them know that, yes, the shelter is there, the caseworkers are overloaded, but these are your resources. You know, give us that time to come in so the people can feel, okay, we are not alone. You know, because you're looking at it from a case point of view. Oh, I have like 20 people. How can I deal with 20 people? I get it. This is why we're here. You know, we're, we're here to try to help the main person, the client. But 95% of shelter people don't even know that resources are out there because nobody is letting them know. You know, so that's why they get more frustrated. Um, and I feel like, you know, it's, it's mainly um, DHS, you know, maybe don't want them to bring other people in. Um, I mean, if they were doing, honestly, if DHS and the government was doing what they were supposed to do, we wouldn't exist, but they're not. So this is why people, you know, feel frustrated, but, you know, I, I, I think if they would open it up to, you know, giving out the resources to say, hey, you can go there, or hey, you can go there, people wouldn't get, you know, that frustrated. So. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you once again, Elizabeth, for coming on the Hear Our Voices podcast. Mm -hmm. You guys, follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram. If Elizabeth would like to leave her information in the description, you will see it. If not, then you won't see it. Sorry about that. And mm -hmm. um, hope the stories and insight of how it has been over the years. She told you over 12 years ago. So a lot of things have not changed and some things have changed. It's been very slowly, but it's been happening. Yeah. And I hope these stories can open your eyes on how people are living and make you yeah. see us as people, as human. So if you want to DM me, Kade Davis on Instagram, Twitter information will be down below and also mm -hmm. Instagram for our Hear Our Voices podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Thank you for listening. Following you already on Twitter. Yes. Thank you for listening. Thank you, too. Talk to you, guys, next week. Bye.